Hi everyone, this is Adam Hoff of the National Operations Center of Excellence. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to get started in about five minutes. Um, so for those of you waiting on the line, we'll get started in about five minutes or so to let everybody join. Um, in the meantime, you should see a uh, screen up with Ohio's RNC preparation there. Um, but you'll hear back from us again in about five minutes. Thanks so much.
Hi everyone, this is Adam Hoffs of the National Operations Center of Excellence. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before we do, just want to say how excited we are to have um, our speakers from the Ohio Department of Transportation um, and Ohio State Patrol. Um, this is a fantastic webinar that we have lined up, especially as we take more of a closer look at special events, how traffic incident management um, and TISMO in general applies to special events. For those who haven't um, checked out our, our stuff on the solar eclipse, make sure to go to our website and, and take a look at the preparation work um, that the states were doing on the solar eclipse. Um, you know, similar in the special event environment. Um, everybody will be on hold throughout this webinar. We are taking questions. You can ask questions in the little question box um, uh, down on your on your GoToMeeting um, panel bar there, um, and we'll moderate any questions there at the end. Um, and uh, this is being recorded so that we can share, uh, so that you can share this resource with uh, your colleagues and, and anybody else you think will be interested. So. Um, be sure to remember that. We'll follow up afterwards with the, with the recording. Um, so with us today is, is Tom Corey, uh, Deputy Director of Operations from the Ohio Department of Transportation, Howard Huebner, uh, ODOT's District 3 Deputy Director, Carl Merkel, the Emergency Operations and SIM Coordinator um, for Ohio Department of Transportation, and uh, Staff Lieutenant Edward Mejia, Jr. Um, of Ohio State Patrol. So I'm going to turn it over to, to those folks um, and let them uh, Give us an overview of the preparation and, and post events uh, work on the Republican National Convention. Thanks, gentlemen. Okay, th thank you. Um, I'm Tom Corey, and yeah, I'll be moder moderating the today's presentation of Ohio's R RNC preparation and review. I uh, present here by Ohio Department of Transportation and Ohio State Highway Patrol. Um, yeah, this is an overview and a review of uh, July 18th to 21st, 2016 Republican National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Carl Merkel to, to begin the presentation. All right. We can get her to advance. Okay. Slight technical difficulty here. It's not advanced earlier, but not advancing now. Give us one moment here. We are having a slight technical difficulty. Not a problem at all. We'll uh, edit this out in post-production so that it looks perfect on the nightly news. Okay. <laughs> While we let those gentlemen figure that out, um, we are going to post some things in the chat box here about some of the resources that um, that we have at NOCO um, for on the solar eclipse, like I mentioned, and then additional resources where people like Ohio are, are um, you know, generous enough to share all the good work that they're doing. So uh, look for those at the end. It looks like we got this uh, figured out, so I'll turn it back to you guys. Okay, thank you. Yes, we're ready to go. All right. Well, to get started here. Uh, you know, on July uh, 8, 2014, um, we found out that Cleveland was awarded the Republican National Convention. And um, on July 9th of 2015, uh, FHWA uh, 2016, we did an RNC peer exchange. What we did is uh, uh, we got it our, in our executive staff and had a group and actually uh, talked to some other, kind of like what we're doing today, sharing information. But we reached out to uh, Minnesota DOT, Florida, and North Carolina. And, uh, you know, even though you sit and you go through there and, and gather as much information as you possibly can, uh, it's still overwhelming when you actually uh, uh, start working on the event. So we found out that the RNC was declared a 
National Special Security uh, event, and uh, participants is going to be the Department of Homeland Security, United States Secret Service, the Federal Bureau of in, uh, Investigation, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So we started going up to Cleveland, doing a lot of traveling, uh, you know, from the Columbus area and uh, around the different areas. And we went up and we started having meetings uh, with the, all the players, you know, the, the heads. And uh, there was uh, different uh, subcommittees. But, you know, the first time we went up there, it lasted about all, about 20 minutes. And we introduced ourselves. And we actually, they told us that uh, there's going to be uh, many things that we'll be covering in the future. But basically that first meeting is just seeing who we are and who we work for. And like I say, yeah, and then they, like I say, they kind of uh, ex explained to us the uh, what a national uh, special security event was, and and give us some examples. And then uh, we start getting in, in talking about the area. Um, this here is not marked off by any any means, but uh, there was a secure perimeter, and uh, what we uh, what we did is uh, we identified the streets and. That way, we knew what we had for closures and uh, and what all it was going to entail to be able to make them closures happen. And like I say, that was uh, greatly in partnership with the uh, with the Highway State Patrol. So, on a patrol uh, perspective, uh, we also attended uh, subcommittees uh, that the uh, Secret Service um, moderated. And obviously, when you look at a uh, overview photograph of uh, the, the area that was going to be uh, enclosed in this particular venue, there's a, a lot of ground to cover and a lot of areas uh, that we needed uh, law enforcement as well as our partners with ODOT to make sure that we uh, funneled uh, or cut off traffic uh, in order to make sure that we, we uh, protected uh, all the delegates and all the citizens uh, in that particular area of Cleveland, downtown uh, Cleveland there. So um, right off the bat, we realized that it was better to do this together than to try to work as individuals and accomplish this mission. So one of the, one of the things that I've noticed throughout my career with the Highway Patrol is uh, from, the, from, from the local level up to uh, the, the headquarters level, um, ODA and uh, Highway Patrol have always maintained a very good uh, partnership and uh, understanding what our missions are and how we can accomplish those missions together. So as you can see this slide, there was a lot of uh, area to cover and a great partnership developed uh, because of this event. Okay. Now when we went up there and started uh, going to uh, like we went to the communications um, center to tell us they, they identified who was going to work into what they call the MAC, which is the Multi-Agency Communication Center. And then uh, they, they let us know that there was going to be 24 subcommittees. So there's a committee on arrangements, and there's a transportation committee, and a uh, housing committee. And there was just a huge amount that went in, into this. So anyway, and when we, when we talked in these here meetings, uh, they always put this uh, uh, sign up here or let us know that, you know, there's sensitive uh, material here that you did not uh, share it at all. So uh, they made sure that everybody in that room, you know, that it stayed, you know, pretty much within that room or you could share uh, some of the information with your superior to, to be able to work out the event. So they, they, they identified the dates, you know, which, which was July 18th through the 21st, 2016. They uh, identified where it was actually going to be held, which was the Quicken Loans Arena, would be the uh, official venue, but with all the different entities, uh, there was multi-venues multi, uh, that was selected. And, um, you know, some of them in the communication might have been as far away as, uh, as it's five to ten miles away. So, uh, but there was many, like uh, the patrol would be in a venue, and um, the ODNR, and the Ohio Department of Re uh, Natural Resources. So there was ma many different venues that was uh, 
that was used. And then he identified the uh, airports that was involved, uh, as you see, Cleveland, and then uh, we had a, there's another smaller airport in Cleveland, and then the Akron Canton area. And then they also they designed a website that anyone could go to to actually uh, gather information uh, throughout the event. So to give you just a kind of a, a, a quick snapshot about what Carl was talking about with venues. Um, not only did we have to worry about, and I'm talking about the Highway Patrol with security, uh, providing security for all these delegates and all these visitors, but they also had to figure out ways to uh, protect those venues uh, by either using, um, you know, some type of uh, jersey walls or fencing or uh, other equipment to keep these venues safe. So. Just a, an example, uh, the first day that those delegates showed up, I believe it was on July the 17th, uh, they had a, uh, a, like a welcome to Cleveland party and it was uh, conducted at the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So if you could imagine hundreds of people uh, and that aerial shot that you saw in the beginning there, it may have been in that at the north part of the, of the uh, venue. Uh, you, you got to, and all these folks are coming from different points. These delegates are coming from different points uh, in and around the city of Cleveland. So they're coming from the east, uh, south, and west, and they're transporting all these folks into different arteries. There was some construction that was going on down uh, around the city of Cleveland, and uh, we wanted to make sure that there was uh, none of these protesters would use any types of devices or themselves uh, to block them from reaching uh, these venues and, and that one particular venue uh, drew a lot of people there. That was a kind of like a, a welcome to Cleveland party. Okay. Now in July 2015, uh, you know, the city of Cleveland, we had to get, we had to get the partnership rolling. I mean, there was, you know, you had to reach in and, and, and talk to everyone that, you know, the housing, you know, the, Every everything that was is connected, you know, the, the law enforcement, the the fire department, and getting everybody on board, and they actually had their little subcommittees under the uh, the big sub subcommittees under uh, the NSSE. So they they worked in uh, in unison, and then they would send their leadership to the main subcommittees and uh, pr pr present any other information. Then on August the 8th, 2015, there was, there was a debate, and as far as ODOT, uh, we went out and did uh, litter and ve vegetation control. Uh, one week prior to the event, uh, we staged equipment for standby, um, and when we talk about our District 12, that's the district that was in uh, the Cleveland area. So, uh, and we also worked with our uh, central office in Columbus Traffic Management Center. And then uh, we also had the State um, Emergency Operations Center, which also activated uh, during the event. And then in September 2015, uh, we met with the Department of Public Safety, uh, with uh, Staff Lieutenant Mejia's group, and we started working out with all the agencies how we was going to partner and how we'd work together to make this event happen. So, if you look there in this photograph, if you look into the background there, there's all the buses that was uh, utilized during that event. And you got to realize Cleveland is lake behind it. So you only had just a uh, small uh, avenue to even get into downtown Cleveland. So you see there was 365 uh, passenger buses and, and 60 others, which you, know, which you see your grand total of 300, or 425. And our des des uh, delegated housing and logistics, we had 16,000 hotel rooms in, in the Northeast with um, 5,000 hotels. And if you see this, we anticipated 50,000 attendees with uh, 15,000 uh, just credentialed media. So that ought to give you an idea how much, how many eyes was, um, you know, on this event. So. Here is the way our uh, uh, our housing was. This is where everybody was being bused from. So you can see uh, we have Cleveland, and we, we had housing as far uh, far down as Akron, and all the way over to uh, Sandusky. And I'll tell you, throughout the during the event, uh, there was an issue that happened at the Sandusky Hotel. 
uh, revol uh, uh, involving some smoke, and we had to wind up moving them delegates and finding rooms for them. So uh, it was just a little glitch that we had to to work on throughout that event. Okay, this here was uh, you know is identifying uh, the exits. Uh, you know where all this busing was. Uh, you know how it was going to get down into town. And like I say, you see it's color coded, you know, so everyone uh, knew where they was going to get off uh, and, and leave the event. Okay, now this here is, this is our ODOT pre uh, uh, preparation. And a, we talked, to, you know, we really worked on our staffing, how it was all going to work, and our equipment, uh, what all was going to be needed in that area. Uh, that would help and help the, uh, help the highway patrol uh, getting the proper signage in, in that area due to the rest many restrictions we had, not only securing the area of the event, but also just getting into downtown. And then the, uh, the increased freeway maintenance, if we had anything wrong with the roadways, anything thrown out into the roadways, uh, any potholes developed, make sure everything was all uh, you know, up in maintenance. Uh, vegetation, we went out prior, did all kind of mowing, uh, you know, whatever, had our high cut mowers in, getting behind, behind guard rails so we can have good visibility of anything that actually could have got dropped off uh, so we could have a good visual. And then we had, uh, talk about our incident management, um, and we'll get into it a little later on in this presentation, talking about how we developed our uh, our district operations center working with the Ohio Emergency Management Agency. Uh, we did some graffiti removal, and I'll tell you, a week before the event, we was removing it because uh, there was some stuff, and even uh, on this graffiti, it, uh, there was some similarities. So we had to make sure that was all reported. We'd have our ODOT employees actually report that to us. So. Um, Homeland Security would look and see if there's any anything that uh, they would put together as far as um, you know communication with those markings. And then we have uh, our litter control. Uh, we have a slide on how much we collected, and then um, maintenance agreements. You know, working with uh, Cleveland and uh, uh, the you know even the locals uh, on maintenance agreements, tabletop exercises. We did tabletop exercises for each district and went through different, different scenarios, not only what could happen down within the event, but what about if we had a, uh, a flooding or high winds or a, a, some kind of event or a massive hazmat exercise. So we, we went through some different uh, scenarios in, in case we had to move a, maybe another district up with equipment uh, to aid in the uh, in any possible uh, uh, event or disaster, and then we have our uh, critical infrastructure identification. We uh, identified our bridges, what was uh, what was crit uh, critical, and uh, we did a close monitoring of that. We had our traffic cameras that we used, and uh, and then we have we added um, we have freeway service patrol in all of our uh, major cities. So what we did was uh, rob from the other areas and uh, put some extra freeway service patrols that you know have gasoline, their basic EMTs, uh, you know, charging, you know, um, pulling, they push vehicles off the road. So we brought them up. And then we uh, we had uh, towers and haulers on on contract uh, at the ready if we need to have somebody there real quick to get any kind of large. Uh, vehicle out of the way, as, as, as well as like our triple ways uh, to get our um, our cars out of the way. And then we uh, we had homeland security uh, training. We had intelligence liaison officer training on you know what to identify uh, out there. You know whether it would be a pipe bomb, a bag, you know something that any kind of suspicious activity. They we made uh, our DOT aware of. We, uh, we have uh, what we call the multi-agency um, radio communication system uh, and the marks. Uh, since the, the, the city of Cleveland uh, didn't work off a, a mark system, so we had two different communications. 
So we had to share and give radios of ours portables to uh, the city of Cleveland, and then there was a lead that would make contact with our leadership and uh, to be able to communicate with Cleveland and DOT and the, the patrol throughout the event. And of course, we have our engineering. We had a major construction going on at that particular time. We had the George Bonovich Bridge that was under construction. So uh, we didn't have that accessible to us, but we use it as an asset. We, we actually put a, a portable marks tower out there in case we got overloaded uh, on our communications towers, we had that uh, tower out there sitting on the George Orovitz Bridge to actually uh, take care of anything in case we got overloaded in communications. And that would bounce back to our ODOT dist or, uh, DOT trans um, district. Okay, and then uh, we uh, also provided, we had uh, private lots for parking. And, and then we had uh, baseline event closers, um, and then, like I say, uh, we have a, a great communication plan, which we'll go over here uh, here in a few, and then um, talk about haulers, contractors, and like I say, and then we have what they call a blue book that is within the ODOT that has all the numbers that we need to have to do any type of communication. I mean, it's has every number of every highway worker on the road and all the way to our executive leadership. Okay, so we talked about litter. So we had 10,560 bags of, 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 of litter we removed, 22,865 square feet of graffiti, uh, 1,000 uh, or 1,200 uh, labor hours on vegetation. Sweeping, we had 2,170 miles. Guardrail, we fixed uh, 1,608 feet, and we did 296 miles of uh, herbicidal uh, spray. Now, when we talk about um, vegetation control, some of that is, is related to sight distance issues that you have on curves on interstates and exit and entrance ramps which give us the ability to see what's going on further up the road. So that's not just mowing. A lot of labor hours went into that vegetation control. Herbicidal spraying helps us with some of that. But as, as Carl mentioned, um, the preparation for this actually started back in 2014 with our maintenance workforce. The day we got this was the day we started identifying other issues that we were going to see occur throughout. And we'll talk more about that later in the, in the presentation. Okay, we talked about ongoing pro projects. Here was the construction on the um, George Bornovich Bridge. Uh, and then, like I say, uh, our, our contractor worked real well and was very uh, cooperative uh, with us on this event. Okay, we identified, that, like I say, this is, this is some work areas actually from the uh, George Bornovich uh, construction. And we actually took advantage. And these are parking areas that we identified that if we got overcome with parking, we could bring them out of here into these areas and they, they actually could uh, park in these areas. Actually, the contractor actually leveled out some areas and compacted, so if we needed to park a bus or put bar buses over in the areas, we could do that. Additionally, um, as the construction was going on, um, we had to include an additional exit ramp. It didn't stay in place permanently, but for this event, this was a better location for it so they can make left right turns. Um, the ramp that was in place only allowed for one direction of travel. So we negotiated that with the contractor at the G uh, George V. Voinovich Bridge, and he created that ramp for us. It's no longer in play because we took it back out after the event. But this, this is part of the partnering that went on with ODOT and the contract. Okay, you can see that it's just how the buses traveled into the vent and uh, where the, the parking was uh, for the GOP buses. And uh, like I say, uh, it was very, very complex, uh, um, you know, situation. And then here we go with what kind of changes. So everything's going real smooth. We think things are going, you know, 
Nothing will happen, and then it does. So we started talking about our additional preparation. We had freeway pinch points, and as Carl stated, you know, in, in Cleveland, there's no way north. Everything comes in from the south, east, or west. So we were dealing mainly with three interstates that if any one of those closed or there was an incident on it, it, it created a, a big problem for this event. So we at ODOT started looking at pinch point identification and what, what are we going to be able to do to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, we expanded our freeway service patrols. There was a heightened sense of security with our incident management. And I know they went through and, and secured manholes and other entry points that, that basically you don't think about early in the, in the process. But as we talked about it, you know, I said we started planning this in 14. The number one thing I talked to all of our crews about, and we started advancing down from District 12 into District 3 and District 4, and eventually got 754 people involved in this event through ODOT, was the fact that the one thing is going to be certain, things are going to change. Just when we thought we were going to get everything planned, we had an idea what we were going to do, it was going to change, so be prepared to change. And just like Butch mentioned, uh, one of the things that we had to uh, really focus on when it came to that those pinch points were um, we needed help. So we had approximately um, 1,400 officers assigned to the venue. We still had to provide service to the rest of the state of Ohio uh, as far as we couldn't just uh, move all of our assets and resources uh, from all across the state, uh, law enforcement wise, up to do this. So it was a good partnership between the, the folks in ODOT keeping an eye on those pinch points as well as using aviation and we had to develop different alternative routes. So that was one of the things that we looked at from a patrol standpoint to make sure that if something were to happen on one of these uh, main routes that was coming into the venue from the east, west, or the south, that we had an alternative route. And we also had highway patrol officers assigned with these uh, delegates that was going to provide security in case they did get stopped uh, on the way to the venue. So what you see here is, you know, as we, as we went through and we, we identified the pinch points, we also had to identify um, routes that our, our patrols would be able to, to maneuver through to inform anybody of anything that was coming into the city that looked suspicious or out of place. So we identified 15 routes that were patrolled 24 hours a day for the entire length of time from actually the 17th all the way through the 21st. So these these Trucks were uh, equipped with GPS, ABL, and onboard cameras. And all those feeds went directly back to the District 12 um, command center where all these operations were being reviewed, overseen, and adjustments made. And the communication went from that location up to the MAC. This slide here, this is a video. We just kind of want to show you how our GPS ABL actually worked. And uh, we do have, it was a situation that our driver actually, uh, uh, you know, called in. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it worked out. It was nothing serious. But this just gives you an idea of what we could see and actually cap capture it on our cameras. And as you're watching this, um, and you'll see a box truck up on the left, and actually someone actually runs across the road 
and uh, gets in a car in front of him, and we instructed our drivers not to engage, that they to stay back and just call in. And part of this, what this GPS ABL was too, it was actually an ongoing research project that we was actually uh, performing, and uh, through this event, we we see the the advantage even with our our snow and ice control here, but uh, how we can use this uh, here at ODOT with the with the cameras. So odd odd situation, like Carl said, as you come up on this. Traditionally, you don't see someone abandon a box truck in the middle of an interstate and run across the road to get into another vehicle. So that raised suspicions. Um, that communication went into our uh, control center, which then went up to the MAC, and we were sitting at the MAC with the highway patrol. It was communicated immediately, and it was investigated immediately. So these are the types of things that we caught throughout the week. Um, you notice the plow on the front of that truck, and every one of our patrols carry the plow because the idea was anything that was left on that highway, push it off, we'll come back and get it later. But the idea was to keep traffic moving. And one of the methods that uh, some of the protesters would, protesters would use is uh, to use either a panel van with no windows or a box truck, similar to what the one you see in the video. Uh, they would have an inexpensive mattress and they could uh, open the rear, drop what we call a sleeping dragon, typically uh, different types. Well, one in particular was a 55-gallon drum that was uh, filled with concrete and had uh, uh, two sleeves uh, about midway down the barrel made of PVC. The, the PVC pipe in there had a pin and they would have uh, some type of uh, locking me mechanism tied around their wrists uh, with a carabiner on the end and they would uh, lock that carabiner around the pin and uh, obviously it would take them uh, seconds to deploy this this uh, this device and, uh, and that would cause uh, a major backup and or uh, cause the, uh, de the delegates to, to, to reroute them to a different location. Uh, I think they uh, their main purpose was to uh, obviously make a splash in the media but also uh, it was uh, to stop those delegates from getting to the venue so uh, with this partnership that we developed uh, with ODOT that those guys were great about seeing in advance something that was unusual uh, stopped on the road, especially some type of uh, vehicle that would be used to deploy these devices. So this is where you're seeing the eyes on the road and the patrols and ODOT crews. Um, I got to give those guys credit that it's not easy to be in a truck, but those drivers were in those trucks for 12 straight hours. Uh, taking short breaks for a restroom and to grab a bite to eat, but the, their partner would drive at that time. Those trucks never stopped throughout that, that whole process, and um, kudos to them. They did a great job, and it helped us a lot in the field. And another thing, uh, talking about our drivers, we, we made sure there was two people in that truck because during the analysis and everything like that, you know, what better way to get down in downtown Cleveland would be to hijack one of our uh, well, one of our trucks and, and go down into town. So uh, we always made sure uh, we made sure there was always two people uh, in a, in a truck, and they actually they all had uh, the, what we call our Mark's radio system, and they had to do periodic uh, radio checks within the district operations center. Additionally, each of our facilities were required to do a walk-around inspection at the facilities of the vehicles that were on site and make a call if there was any change every hour. This is what you see that we had in our um, control center in District 12. It's a set of computer monitors that will monitor not only the cameras that are stationary in the highway, but it gave us the opportunity to monitor everything that was going on on the road instantly. We had some uh, single resource stationary teams also where um, they carried different items. One of the, one of the things we had heard um, going into this was that they would park buses out on the roadway. They chained themselves to, as uh, the lieutenant stated, a PVC pipe inside the bus. Someone would eliminate and throw away the keys so it couldn't be moved. It, what we did is we made sure we had uh, ignition switches on site, our mechanics were out on the road at all times. 
If that happened, any one of our mechanics would be able to swap out an ignition switch probably within five minutes and have that vehicle up and running be able to move it off the highway. Um, some of the, some of the uh, patrols and the eyes on the road and the single resource are what you see here is a front mounted broom, skid steers to be able to move things off the highway in the event something happened. The trucks were actually carrying some of their spreaders as a matter of fact and we had to sand in each of those trucks therefore if we had a spill on the road we could immediately uh, put sand down to absorb that and be able to remove it with a skid steer, open back up the traffic. Okay, this here just uh, identifies where uh, some of the locations was, uh, you know, within the mapping area and, and knowing uh, wh where they was actually stationed. Because during the event, we actually um, had, had to move, we actually moved one of our uh, staging areas up closer uh, to Cleveland. Yeah. What, what you see on that map is the Euclid Independence Jog at Cleveland River Edge. These are all different outposts from different counties that we coordinated between three districts um, to make sure that we had every pinch point in the city covered. And not only did we cover the pinch point, if we had to move that through to take care of an incident, we also had a, another ring of crews ready to move up. So if we move somebody off the Interbell Bridge in to take care of an incident, we already had another crew set to take their place on the Interbell Bridge staging area. Okay, this here just kind of tell you what our, our response teams co uh, carried, was equipped with. Uh, you know, we had a traffic control truck with an attenuator, which is a crash device in behind a uh, dump, uh, dump truck. We had uh, loaders on trailers with buckets and forks. We had steel plates, uh, and, and we'll talk about that here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, we have some pictures of them steel plates uh, we, of removing possible dragons off the road. Uh, we had brooms, uh, and like I say, it was loaded with sand. And the brooms was was hearing that they might possibly dump uh, nails, and uh, we also had uh, magnets uh, on our skid steers that would be able to pick up um, the, uh, uh, the nails or any kind of debris, sharp debris like that. And then also uh, we had the brooms for, uh, you know, somebody dumped nails, they could have been aluminum nails and not be picked up by a, uh, uh, a magnet. So well, we was just trying to cover all the bases. And then like I said, we had response pickup trucks and you see what's on there, torches, um, push bumpers, and we actually, uh, the, the district purchased uh, like the jaws of life that uh, that the fire departments have because if there would have been gasoline where they need to do some kind of cutting, we uh, we would have that to not cause any spark. So we tried to put. Uh, there was a lot of thought when this. There was a lot of ideas, and it was good information sharing. This is just another. Um, Photograph of uh, of our mobile response units. Yeah, you see them as far south on 271 down by the turnpike. Um, those are the units that would be able to move up into downtown Cleveland in the event someone had to move to take care of an incident. So um, this would be a good time. Um, we actually we had this moved up and this, and say the way uh, uh, Howard just mentioned that we would move up. Now what we did was, well, this is what we utilized the emergency operations center uh, in the Columbus area if we need to move up and then uh, uh, turn it over to Tom how they prepped to be ready to move up to us. Yeah, exactly, Carl. We had, we had all this going on in Cleveland and moving all our resources up. Um, and in the new Philadelphia area um, on farther south, we actually staged equipment up into the Medina uh, area and District 3 area in the event that we needed uh, extra resources to move on up. And the other thing also we were taking a look at, there was still day-to-day -day, day -day operations in the other outlying districts that had to be maintained while their resources, resources were uh, maintaining up in Cleveland, the RNC. Just, just more of our uh, mobile response units uh, setting at the ready and, you know, and, and getting word back from uh, patrol, uh, you know, they said that a lot of these demonstrators by having us setting out there along the roads, they think 
be, doing that discouraged a lot of uh, protesters for trying anything, you know, with seeing plows, seeing, you know, all this heavy machinery that uh, it, it discouraged a lot of them. Yeah, and I, you know, like Carl said, these were all visible. You see those right there on the side of the road. We had them in the medians. We had them on the exit and entrance ramps in the gore areas. All of these were up and ready to go. They were manned 24 hours a day for the entire period. Um, thank goodness we didn't have a lot that we had to do. There were some things that we took care of, but in all reality, I think because we were so visible, because we did have all this equipment ready, we actually even had bulldozers in downtown Cleveland. And again, we had a truck that turned over. We could bulldoze that truck off the road until such time as we could come back and remove it. Okay, we talked about the George Boyevich Bridge. We took advantage of it. We actually we staged equipment right on top of the uh, the bridge, so uh, we had stuff right close to Cleveland if we we needed to utilize it. So obviously, uh, from a protester's uh, standpoint, they wanted to try to make a, as a big a splash as possible in the media. Uh, as I previously mentioned, some of the uh, devices that they used. Uh, in order to slow traffic down and or uh, have a lot of material and manpower to defeat these devices are pictured here. The one on the top left there, that one is a, uh, a sleeping dragon. Uh, that's a 55 gallon drum, uh, typically constructed of concrete and uh, they usually put some uh, dirty material in there. So they'll uh, throw pieces of rebarb, uh, uh, you know, odds and ends, you know, uh, pieces of metal, a water pump, uh, for a vehicle or so, so when you try to start defeating those uh, manually with uh, with equipment, uh, it, first of all, it's labor intensive and time consuming. And one of the great things about this partnership was that we uh, developed contingency plans in order to move those folks safely and allow traffic to continue uh, without giving them the opportunity to uh, accomplish their mission of either uh, stopping the delegates from reaching the venue or uh, the general public from being uh, jammed up in traffic because of these folks here. Um, the photo on the bottom is uh, just a typical human chain, but if you could imagine that tube that's inside the 55-gallon uh, drum, the, uh, another type of dragon would be uh, that they would uh, have just a portable one that they could stick their arms into without the uh, concrete on there, and then they would uh, wrap that particular dragon with uh, you know, dirty material like feces or uh, axle grease and then uh, wrap that with saran wrap and then duct tape so that uh, any responding officers would have to be uh, uh, dressed up in hazmat suits in order to defeat those, uh, those uh, dragons. So it would it'd be a lot easier if we could just scoop them up and move them off the side of the road and they could let traffic continue to move on and not give them the, the opportunity to make a splash or to inconvenience, you know, the delegates and or the public. So uh, uh, it was a very, very well coordinated effort between the patrol and ODOT to make sure that we had plans in place to make this thing happen. One of the things, uh, the patrol was located at our center, right next to us at our uh, central office here in Columbus. And a lot of times we would have meetings uh, just, uh, you know, here, between uh, ODOT and the patrol and talking about these uh, sleeping dragons, they, they told us to watch for trucks hauling mattresses or it, did we see PV, if there's truckloads of PVC pipe. So anyway, the, so our ODOT patrol trucks, if they see anything like that, they was able to communicate to our district operations center and, uh, and make them aware of it. We received a lot of intelligence from our intel folks that um, these folks, uh, they typically, uh, they find a, a vacant building and they, and they squat there or maybe they get some money uh, and they buy, a, you know, some, they rent some space at a warehouse and uh, they, they put these things together and then they, uh, like mentioned previously, they use a mattress to deploy that device there or the other devices uh, are not as um, transportation, you know, there's not a big burden on transportation. You could have a car or uh, they could use a junk vehicle like uh, uh, Butch mentioned earlier, where they uh, just stopped the vehicle in the middle of an intersection, uh, they've already built the dragons into the vehicle, and the occupants of the vehicle just get out and uh, stick their arms inside of it and uh, stop traffic that way. 
Okay. Uh, one thing uh, we found out when we was going through the, uh, our meetings that our chief legal at the Ohio Department of Transportation says uh, we didn't really want to get involved in moving any uh, people off the road. Uh, let's, let's leave that to the, the guys carrying the guns because if somebody was locked in a dragon, then it'd fall over, then we would probably have a liability. So uh, what we did was work together uh, with, uh, with our district and uh, we uh, sent our training department up and actually trained uh, uh, the, the patrol to run the ODOT equipment. So we, uh, the patrol, we call that a, a, a spatula. I know that uh, our folks here, um, uh, they had probably a better better technical term for that equipment there, but we call it the uh, protester spatula. And basically we prepared for the worst. So the worst case scenario uh, that was, uh, that involved a lot of labor and or equipment to move something was going to be the, the, the if those protesters deployed a 55 gallon drum there. And uh, ODOT did a great job of putting together that steel plate there so that uh, we would put a team of approximately six uh, troopers to move the uh, occupants that are attached to those devices uh, onto that steel plate. And then we would, uh, train. Uh, they provided us training and certified us in the operation of uh, that piece of uh, equipment, and we would slide that underneath, tilt the barrels back just enough so that we can get that spatula underneath it, and then we would uh, shove those barrels on there. Nobody would get hurt. They would be secure on that steel plate there, and we could just basically scoop them up like you were frying an egg uh, and move them off the road and then uh, make sure that the roadway was opened up again and nobody was injured in the process. And this is, this is one of the things I talked about, um, expect change, because we talked about this at a meeting very late in, in, in the stages. Um, it was brought to our attention we could have a problem, and, and literally in a room of probably 55 people, we came up with this idea, um, developed a purchase order, and got this done within a week. So the steel plates are attached to a set of forks on those loaders or skid steers. They're attached with a chain so they couldn't come loose. We also uh, picked up some uh, barrel dollies to, to assist. So when we went out there, not only did we have a bucket for that, we were able to drop this and put a bucket on, but we could drop a bucket and put one of these on. And this is, this is how we were able to help the Highway Patrol. Then they come in, we trained them, and I think everything went very well. I think everybody was confident in what was going on. You see here, Highway Patrol officer being trained in the skid steer. Now we made two different sizes of these, one with, for the uh, large case loaders, some for the small skid steers. I say we had them go through uh, a series of cones, and one thing the patrol did was they actually went through their department and found out some of their country guys had actually run this equipment, which made it a lot simpler to be able to uh, teach them to run the equipment. So now we're going to talk about the communication plan, which, you know, that, that changed every day right up until the, I think I sent it to you finally on the Friday before the RNC, correct? Yeah, yeah. See, I'd be this, nervous. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I was nervous too because this, this took a year. Um, when we looked at this and how we were going to get communication to everybody that needed to know, not only was the District Emergency Operations Center um, key in this, the MAC was, but law enforcement, local law enforcement, Ohio Highway Patrol, central office, and then back to the field incident command. Like I said, we had a lot of task force and single resources out there. And what we decided to do was we, we could have all been on one March unit, but you know we had 264 people out there trying to communicate all at one time. We broke it down into these different communication groups, and that kept our span of control at about a seven to one. Um, everybody knows, and if you are part of Incident Command, span of control is one of the most difficult things to, to preach, to practice, and to make sure everybody understands. Um, this gave us the opportunity that every one of those groups communicate with each other. Supervisors were able to communicate with an Incident Commander, and the Field Incident Command was able to communicate with me, and then I, I communicated directly with the DEOC who communicated to the MAC. 
as you see, like I say, Howard did an excellent job putting that together because you notice he's got everything color coded, and you've seen the roads on our patrols was color coded. That matched with this communication plan. And you know, say the light blue area up where it says uh, Kaya, it's Kai for Cuyahoga in Cleveland. If if they moved in somewhere, then we could take you know the what we call the Medina MED down here, the Medina area. You could take that task force or any of those resources and come up and fill. And then what we on the bottom end of that, then Tom talked about he moved resources up from the outlying districts that was actually not uh, fully involved. They could come up and fill in at uh, you know in the lower uh, portion there in the lower di uh, districts that was not actively engaged uh, at, the, at the front. This is a shot of the uh, District 12 DEOC. We monitored and identified where everybody was at every minute of every day. One of the things that was critical that we made sure we talked about was when we deployed, we gave them a return time because if we lost communication, we knew what a time for, what to expect them to come back. If they didn't come back, then we knew where they should have been and we could go look for them. But it was critical. Each district had a representative within that DEOC. That was District 3, 4, and 12. Additionally, then, we had the MAC that was communication, com communicating with the District 12 DEOC, and then these people were communicating back to those field units to make sure that that span of control stayed manageable throughout the incident. And what it made nice about coming back to the district uh, operations center, then that way, when they communicated to MAC, you only had one person. So that person at the MAC wasn't getting overloaded with multiple radio or, or phone calls regarding a situation that's out there. Because when you're sent at that MAC, you know, uh, and we have what they call the tactical information of the uh, information center, with what they call the TIC, there's, uh, there's like, one uh, Secret Service, there's one uh, Homeland Security, there might be one person in the city of Cleveland, and ODOT, and then FEMA in there. And uh, when we got that call in there, uh, when you've seen us, I mean, I got to see a senior special agent in action, and I tell you what, they, they, there's no smiling on their faces. So, I mean, it, it's, it's very, very critical and, and serious in, in that room, which obviously uh, has to be. If you look on that whiteboard up at the middle of top of your screen there, you see the color code there. We talked about our patrols out there. Everything matched. And you know in any communication plan, if it fails, you're, the whole event's going to fail. So uh, that was critical to our success with the RNC. Yeah, that communication plan changed 25 times. <laughs> so just uh, right up to the last minute. But. Here's another um, shot of how we were monitoring not only the cameras in the vehicles on the right, the uh, AVL systems, but those cameras on the left that are some of those are the cameras that are mounted permanently out on our interstate highways. And, and now, you know, before I get onto this slide here, uh, the, the traffic management center back in Columbus, I mean, that, that group was constantly monitoring them cameras as well. As well. Uh, normally, they, they do all of the turning of our cameras, um, but for the week of that event, they turned over the, uh, uh, the cameras to us at the MAC and uh, at the District Operations Center, that if there was any kind of word of everything, we could make that uh, transition and move in uh, cameras wherever we need to go. So on Saturday, uh, July 16th, everybody, we started activating. That was the, you know, uh, a couple days before, but we wanted to get up, make sure we're just like getting ready for this webinar. We want to have it ready. We started yesterday to make sure everything worked okay, and uh, that's what we did there. We got up, got everything, and we actually did a, uh, a practice event a month before uh, the actual RNC uh, to test our communications out in case we had to do any critical moves. So. Uh, and uh, so on the 16th, we activated our uh, District 12, which is the Cleveland Area District Operations Center, it's the ODOT, and then uh, the MAC. Uh, I actually worked in the MAC, the Multi-Agency Communication Center. It became active. And then uh, the City of Cleveland was another huge uh, uh, communication center. They activated their center. 
and then uh, and then you see they they activated uh, even the day before, and then uh, the state emergency operations center went into activation that day. So we was fully up and running uh, on the 16th of uh, of July. I think I think you know we had our crews deployed at that time too. So everything yeah. was on the highway on the 16th. I think that went a long way to deter people. I don't think they were ready to see the amount of equipment, bodies, and people, along with law enforcement that were out there ready to react to an incident in the event one happened. And like I say, the picture on the left, it, it is the outside, outside the MAC. Uh, so that was the, the personnel and their personal vehicles here, um, you know, that would, it was there. And then on the back side was all the, uh, the buses uh, you know, um, headed in. That they was all parked in downtown Cleveland at one time, dropping off delegates. So, I'll turn it over to Tom, our moderator, and okay, Carl. Thank you. That, well, that concludes our presentation here uh, on, on the our RNC preparation, and uh, obviously, what these fine gentlemen explained in 55 minutes took actually. Two years to plan it and get it up and running. This was a very uh, 10,000 foot overview of, of what we did. Um, so uh, there's a lot more detail that went into the planning, obviously, as anyone can expect in a, in a big event like this. Uh, but yes, this does conclude our presentation, and uh, and we're open for any questions for the group that maybe anyone may have. Carl and everybody else, thank you so much. That was truly outstanding. Um, not just the information you presented, but the uh, the work that all of you put in. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. If, if others um, do, please feel free to use that question box down below, or um, as you think of them, we can pass them along in, in the next week or so. But uh, I have a couple of questions. My first one is, of all the all the practices that you discussed and um, the partnerships, um, what what sort of been institutionalized into ODOT um, going forward? Not just for special events, but you know. Kind of has become sort of part of regular practice, or at least something that you plan to always keep in your back pocket. Uh, I think one of the big takeaways was just the incident command portion of this. Um, big, big push on incident command. Um, the training of every one of our employees statewide, and implementing that practice even into our snow and ice efforts now. So we've taken that to all different levels. And, and I may add to also to uh, the GPS ABL technology we were using during this event uh, was a research project actually, and we incorporated it into this. So this gave us a real live time uh, experience with GPS ABL, and we're actually moving forward that you know eventually we will have all of our uh, dump trucks, uh, all 1,500 of our uh, snow and ice dump trucks equipped with GPS ABL technology in the future. Oh wow! Yeah, that was another question I had was was on that on the camera technology and the eyes on the road. Um, and I apologize if I missed this, I was kind of fixated on the videos and uh, the shots from that. But was that collected into a TMC for a live feed or was it, how was that arranged? Do you mind uh, repeating? That was, all that? that was all in the EEOC at the district as a live feed. Okay, okay. Did you have to add staff or others to kind of monitor those videos? Um, or was it incorporated into sort of regular monitoring? The, the, we added staff into the DEOC. We didn't add staff at ODOT. We assigned staff that we had on staff to, to, to monitor that. Um, work zone traffic manager was there from District 12. Uh, roadway services manager, the uh, highway management administrator. There were, I want to say there were probably 10 to 12 people in the DEOC at all times from all districts to make sure okay. that everything is Wow. Um, a, a question came in from, from Liz Falcon at New Jersey DOT. Um, her question is, after all the planning um, that you guys did, can you name one thing that didn't go as expected? I really can't. Yeah, really. Not a, I mean, I, I'll tell you what went, but I was amazed that nothing happened. We were able to deter any issues that were out there. And I thought for sure we were going to get something, but honestly, I, I don't know of anything that went bad. Other than a couple of skirmishes that we had at one of the 
the, the checkpoints where the delegates came in, and uh, it was really not a skirmish with law enforcement, more than it was a skirmish amongst themselves. Uh, somebody was burning an American flag, and some other people didn't like it, so they started fighting each other, and we just had to break the fight up. I think uh, it, it probably goes down as one of the most successful uh, national or uh, special national security events uh, in history. I mean, uh, just like um, ODOT reached out to the previous um, venues, we reached out to the Florida Highway Patrol. Uh, we sent uh, an officer down there and looked at their plans and see what they did well. And um, they, you know, they had problems there with uh, protesters, I think, because of all the equipment that we had staged, all the, you know, the preparation that ODOT did, all the stuff, the, all the equipment and uh, law enforcement officers that we had at the venue and uh, assisting those vehicles to get to and from, uh, there wasn't anything that I could think of that we could have did any better. One of the things, uh, and talking about you know, on a success, one, one thing here at Ohio DOT, traffic incident management uh, is a huge part uh, of our, our process. And during that event, we actually just, just right outside the city, while delegates were moving, we had a fatality, and it was cleaned up in 16 minutes. It had, you know, actually happened in the, it's, it's hard to believe, but because we had resources ready to go, patrol was there, 16 minutes we was able to clear a fatality and have open roads and not have any major congestion. Our goal wow. was to make sure every, every mile of highway was covered every 15 minutes. And that's how we came up with the, the, the crews and where we were going to post people to make sure that the eyes on the road, we covered every section of the road every 15 minutes. Wow. We, we hear a lot um, as we talk with states, um, you know, how TIM programs can be the backbone of, um, you know, operations in general, but certainly certainly in a special event like this, and that, that's, that's great to hear. Um, that, you know how helpful your long-established uh, TIM program is. Traffic incident management is sort of assisted. Um, if, if people have any more questions, feel free to enter them in. I, I had one more, and again, I apologize if I if I missed this. Uh, was there any coordination um, with uh, PennDOT or Philadelphia at all um, as they prepared for the DNC? They believe it or not, they they didn't reach out uh, to us at all. I mean. Um, we we're all the high, you know, the high levels that was in in these meetings, and um, I'm sure they would reach out to us. But no, no one, no one reached out to us for prior to theirs. Same on the law enforcement side. Hmm. All right, it doesn't look like there's any more questions, um, and. Uh, just wanted to remind folks we, we did record this and and, and I believe we'll, we'll be able to share some or all of the PowerPoint um, afterwards so we'll get that out to, to attendees um, so you can share with your colleagues um, thank you again um, to, to, to ODOT and, and OSP for this you know unbelievable overview of uh, preparation and and uh, it's it's uh, easy to see how everything went so well given all the, the two years of planning and, and work that you put in um, so at this point, um, and is there any, Tom, do you have any last words or? Um, I'll just wrap up by, by saying that anybody that does get the PowerPoint or goes down this road, uh, the Canada's make the, the power partnership, the partnering. If, uh, if we as ODOT and OSP did not have the combined uh, uh, goal together and, and mission in mind and shared all information that came across our desk with each other, um, we would not have been as successful as this, and you have to get the front lines involved in types of things like this. You know, one thing that amazed me through this whole effort was how motivated the workforce was to participate from both the LST side and the mm -hmm. ODOT side, um, and they were, they were, everybody was all on board, so you can't underestimate the power partnering. Uh, Danny, the other side of that, I will tell you, when we met, rank was left at the door. Our, our HTs communicated with lieutenants, and it was an ongoing communication. And nothing was hidden. Everybody understood what was going on. Everything was clear and concise. Therefore, nobody thought anybody was hiding anything. And I think that was part of our success too. I agree. Mm -hmm. It was a shared uh, 
you know, mission and, and, and end goal was uh, to provide this service uh, to work as a team. There was nothing, uh, everybody checked their egos uh, at the, you know, before they went into meetings and uh, it, it was just a combined effort to make sure that this thing went as smoothly as possible with the resources and the manpower that we had available. But you know, one last thing is, is with me is it wasn't all pretty in them meetings sometimes. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, it went off without a hitch, but when we spent a year together going up there, there, would, there was people f feeling the pressure. Now, with uh, ODOT, OSP, and the law enforcement, it, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was definitely, it, it was good. But, uh, but anyway, um, you know, everybody worked together, and at the very end, uh, it, it was, it was good. Thank you for hosting this very much and inviting us to do well, this. That's great. That's great to hear, um, and certainly it, it sounds like the, the culture that you guys have established and uh, the collaboration was an essential part of the success. Thank, thank you again to, um, to all of you for, for putting this together and, and sharing it with all of us. A, a reminder to attendees, um, we will send out a recording and, and, and slides um, within the next week or so. So thank you again to, thank you again to Tom Corey, Howard Huebner, Carl Merkel, and uh, Staff Lieutenant Edward Mejia. Um, We'll uh, look forward to collaborating more in the future, and uh, thank you again. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, thank you too. You too.